Do you remember what you had for lunch three days ago? Or whether you got out of your bed with your left or your right foot? I will tell you why you forget. How does your memory work? Memories are fuzzy. You don't remember the details. For example, where you put your phone. However, often when you learn something new, you can remember it for a long time. But do you really remember everything? In this lecture, I will tell you exactly how your memory works and how sleep plays a very important role in remembering. Let's start at the very beginning. What is a memory? Memories are believed to be a network of neurons that is active in the brain. But let's go into that in a bit more detail. Neurons are the nerve cells in our brain, and they can send and receive information in your brain. In a way, they are the communicators in our brain. Neurons can communicate with each other via electrical and chemical signals they send to each other. In this way, they can form networks or patterns in the brain. A memory is such a unique network. It's the neurons that are active at the time when something happens. When you activate this exact same set of neurons again, you literally relive the memory, a perfect memory. And the extent of the network of neurons that is reactivated determines the detail of the memory. The network of neurons codes for a memory, and this happens throughout the entire brain. However, there are certain hubs in the brain that are more critical for encoding and processing of memories. The first hub is the hippocampus. You have one on the left side of the brain and one on the right. This is the initial storage of memories. When you experience or learn something, this part of the brain encodes it as a memory. The activation of certain neurons and stores it exactly like this. The main reason why we know that the hippocampus is important is because of Henry Mulayerson. In the 50s, he had a very bad form of epilepsy. Epilepsy tends to occur in the hippocampus, so they took out both hippocampi. Afterwards, he could never remember new things again, but he could remember really old things that were already stored in his long-term memory. You can compare this to the main character in the movie Memento, or if you haven't seen that one, to Dory in Finding Nemo. This example shows that new experiences you have daily and old memories are stored in different parts of the brain. This is the second memory hub, the cortex. Here, memories are processed and consolidated. When you think back to something you've learned, do you also exactly remember how you learned it? Probably not, even so you can re perfectly recall the knowledge. The memory for learning a fact isn't the same as the fact that you can recall. The fact memory is consolidated. You know the capital of France is Paris which is stored in your cortex. But you don't recall the event where you learned this information. The hippocampus stores information as event memories or sequences. Then, if you consolidate to the cortex, you abstract the information that is most critical. We can show this in an example. When you first visit a city and walk to your destination, you see different buildings and landmarks around you. This walk is stored in the hippocampus as an event. Part of this information is consolidated to the cortex as part of a spatial map. Then when you take a new route, this information is abstracted and added to the map as well. Now, when you hear about a new location, let's say a restaurant that just opened up in the same city, you can easily find the location and remember it for a long time. Why? Because you already have a map in your cortex you can refer to. We don't only use our memory systems for spatial information like maps and locations, but we can also create general knowledge networks. For example, in my life, I've encountered different birds. These events are consolidated or abstracted to my cortex. The memory is then in a downsized version. When consolidating memories from the hippocampus to the cortex, my brain extracts overlapping information about the concept of birds. They can fly, they have wings, they have feathers. The advantage of these abstract memories, or semantic memories, is that when you encounter a new bird that looks slightly different, 
you generalize and still recognize that a bird. And you can rapidly update your knowledge network. If your semantic memory is very large and extensive, you can update it even more rapidly. And that's what you get when we call a schema. It's a bit like a mind map with all information connected to the one concept. We don't have memories for the sake of nostalgia, for reminiscing and perfectly remembering the events stored in the hippocampus. The purpose of our memory is to create a model of the world so you can deal with it. So memory is not about remembering the past, it's about being prepared for the future. It's a good thing you don't recall every bit of detail. The more details you remember, the less you can adapt to things that are different. In real life, it's very unlikely you're going to encounter the same thing twice. That's why you want to have the knowledge to stop, for example, at a red light. And it should not be a specific red light, but you want any red light, no matter what it looks like or how the streets are built. So in this case, a non-perfect memory is perfectly suited. Now, when we talk about memory, we also have to talk about sleep. Memories are events, initially stored in the hippocampus and later consolidated to the cortex. Sleep is exactly the moment when you update your memory systems. Compare it to desktop. Throughout the day, you store all the information and files on your desktop, no matter what. At the end of the day, you sift and sort through the information, decide what you want to throw in the trash bin and what information you want to kind of keep and put safely away in a folder. Then afterwards, you can reformat the desktop so it's ready for a new day. After all, you don't want to remember what sandwich you ate yesterday, but you might want to store the knowledge you learn by watching this video in your long-term memory. So the sifting and sorting, or the consolidation, typically happens during sleep. It's a quiet period of rest when there is no new outside information coming in. This might be one of the main reasons we sleep. After all, we spend roughly 30% of our lifetime sleeping. While we don't know the exact reason for this, this could be part of it. Just imagine what it'd be like if I would be consolidating memories while awake. While I'm talking to you, my brain would then at the very same time reactivate memories from earlier during the day. So while I'm trying to pay attention and store new events, I'm also replaying a memory of my son playing early this morning. That would really distract me and interfere with new memories I'm trying to create. During our sleep, we go through different sleep stages. In general, we can make a distinction between REM sleep and non-REM sleep. REM sleep is noticeable because of the rapid eye movements you're making. It's also the sleep stage you can remember most dreams from. These are weird and emotional dreams. Everything else is non-REM sleep, with different substages such as light and deep sleep. The processing happens during this non-REM sleep. In the non-REM sleep, we could see activity in the cortex and very fast and short oscillations of the hippocampus. The two brain areas are communicating. And this is when we believe the hippocampus reactivates the neurons of a memory, so the exact same network of neurons active during an event. The cortex can then update your long-term memory system. This also explains how you can get better in a motor skill like dancing a routine or playing a guitar overnight. It's not, you don't literally learn it, so it's not as if you can place a book under your pillow and learn. But sleep is very important. During the daytime, you practice a certain routine, movement of your body or the fingers on your guitar. This routine is stored in the hippocampus. Then overnight, you consolidate the crucial information to your cortex. So when you try again the next day, you are better at accessing the information and using it. So it might feel like you've gotten better overnight. We know this works but learning how it works is still a challenge. A really good way of learning more about memory and sleep is to let rats run through a maze. In my lab, we have a maze where we let a rat find some food. In this video, the rat already knows the food location. He gets put into the maze, briefly thinks, where am I? And once he recognizes where he is, he'll start running directly to the goal location in the most efficient manner. By running different trials, he created a spatial map, 
just like in the example of walking through a new city. This is really impressive, even more because the maze is see-through. So there's a bit of a mirroring effect, making it even more difficult. The first time, we were even surprised at how good rats can find their way. But why do we do these tests where we let them run the maze and then sleep for four hours? We know a lot about memory, processing and sleep. But there is so much more we don't know. And researching it provides quite some problems. The hippocampus, which is important for memory, it's deep in the brain. So deep, it's nearly impossible to place electrodes to measure brain activity. And that's exactly what we need. We need to be able to tell what every single neuron is doing. In rats, we can get deep enough to place those electrodes, but don't worry, it doesn't harm them. But through the electrodes, I can exactly measure the activation of neurons during the run and then see the exact same neurons reactivated during sleep. This shows that indeed the reactivation is key to processing of memories during sleep. Another reason I work with rats is because I want to research if and when memories separate from the hippocampus. If a memory of the maze and the food location is consolidated from that initial storage to the long-term storage, they don't need the hippocampus to find their way. To be able to test this, we need to be able to temporarily inactivate the hippocampus. And in rodents, we can do that with either light or drugs that are locally given. So you could turn off the hippocampus for a really short time, exactly when the rat is, tries to remember the location of the food. Why do we do these tests and learn how our memory systems work? Our memory is critical. Just imagine what your life would be without them. A disease that is commonly and justly associated with memory loss is Alzheimer's, one of the first mechanisms to be affected in the consolidation of new memories. So if we learn more about how memory works exactly, also during sleep, it can hopefully help patients in the future. Another reason why we want to learn more about how our memories work, apart from just understanding and pure knowledge, is to build better computers. Computers are very good at remembering every last detail, exactly what our brains can't do. But where we can consolidate and generalize to learn, computers don't tend to be very creative. So by understanding the processes in our brains, we can build better computers that are better suited for learning. We started this lecture with the question, how does your memory work? What we saw is that a memory is a network of neurons stored as an event in the hippocampus. When remembering the exact event, the same set of neurons is activated. During our sleep, we consolidate memories to the cortex. In a way, we filter out the important information and neatly stored, for example, in a knowledge network, which is placed in the cortex. There is still a lot we don't know, but I hope that one day we figure out exactly how our memory works and how sleep is crucial in the process. As always, I would like to thank my rats for sleeping and you for staying awake. Mm -hmm.